Good morning and welcome to this time of worship with the Christian Reformed Church of Prince George. It is the second Sunday after Easter, but the reality is that Easter is still happening. If we are truly rooted in the story of Jesus, well then we celebrate Easter, we celebrate his resurrection from the day he rose from the dead, Easter Sunday, all the way until his ascension into heaven, Ascension Day, 40 days later. Uh, we live in this season of Easter. In fact, Easter is the new reality that we live in. We live in a world that is marked by resurrection, resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, and through him, the resurrection of all those who die with him, are baptized into him, for the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life, to be new creations in Christ. And so as we come to worship God today, we are invited into an encounter with the crucified and risen Savior. We worship a living God. And we can be assured that this encounter is there for all of you, for all of us. Because our God is risen and he is still with us because he poured out his Holy Spirit on us. And so we'll receive the greeting of our living God as we encounter him in this time of worship. Grace and peace to you in the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join together in our call to worship today. I invite you to join along with the bolded lines in this call to worship and in our other communal readings together. From Psalm 118, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. In our anguish we cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting us free. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our salvation. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let us worship God.
chapter 1 we hear this that this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you God is light in him there is no darkness at all if we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness we lie and do not live by the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin well, believing in this promise, let us come to God in confession, letting the light of Christ expose the darkness in us so that we can live more and more in fellowship with him. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. But we confess for the times that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We confess for the times we have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. For these things and so much more, we repent and ask for forgiveness. And I invite you now to take a moment of silent prayer before God, confessing your own sins to him. And we pray together, Lord, bring new life where we are worn and tired, new love where we have turned hard-hearted, forgiveness where we feel hurt and where we have wounded, and the joy and freedom of your Holy Spirit where we are prisoners of ourselves. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. But hear the good news that we have for all who pray this kind of prayer with genuineness and authenticity, calling on the name of the Lord for forgiveness. We read this in 1 Peter chapter 1. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. People of God, you are forgiven not because you are faithful, but because Christ was faithful. And his faithfulness is greater than all of the unfaithfulness of the world put together because as son of God and son of man, he died for it all. So that all who call on the name of the Lord will now be without shame. And thanks be to God. We're going to now continue on in a time of prayer. But now having received this grace from God and being renewed in, our gra in God's grace, we now turn our eyes and our hearts and minds and prayer 
for the grace of God to work its way through the world and in our relationships and in our workplaces and in the work of our church and its mission. And so there's a slide that's coming up in just a moment that will have some points for you to consider in prayer because we're going to take time where, well, as a congregation, this is congregational prayer. And so this is one of these weeks where we'll leave about a a three-minute blank period in this video for you to be able to pray on your own or with whoever you're with. And in this time, you might discover that, wow, you need more than three minutes to pray. And others of you might discover, wow, praying for three minutes is a lot longer than I thought it would be. And if that's you, then just feel free to sit in some of the silence as well and then to pray for whatever God places on your heart. But let us turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer for his world. And all God's people say, Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. God disciplines his sons. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for who, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Well, just in these three verses, we have a lot of profound statements and beautiful statements that are made about God and about Christ, about the church as well, and this living our new life in Christ. But for this morning, we'll focus on three things that I think catch our attention as we try to bridge the gap between the audience and community and context that this letter was written to and to the community and context that we live in as a church today. The three things that stick out for us are the tension here in our counterintuitive sense of Easter joy, the tension of living in Easter joy, and then the reminder of our counterintuitive source of Easter joy and the path to Easter joy. And then finally, to make sure we catch the encouragement here 
to the church to live out the countercultural mission with joy. But first, there's this tension of trying to live with Easter joy. Over the last eight to, eight to nine days, especially, I've had a number of conversations with people, uh, neighbors, people in their church, some of you as well. People, the conversations where people are sharing and describing how discouraging and kind of deflating it is these days as we are in a stage of a pandemic where things are supposed to be getting better. Vaccines are rolling out, the numbers should be going down. But how many times have we thought or said over the last 13 months that we think the worst is behind us and then things only seem to get worse? And I think the early church would probably have had a lot of similar experiences. Not so much about pandemics, even though we do know of pandemics much worse than COVID, and I'm sure there were other pandemics or epidemics that we didn't even, that we don't even know of that happened in the first few centuries of the church. But there were so many times where they thought that the worst was behind them in terms of their mission, uh, and then things seemed to get worse. Right after Jesus' resurrection and ascension and Pentecost, we have Peter and John. They are on mission. They are healing someone at a synagogue, and then they get arrested. That's bad. But then they're released. Phew, that one's behind us. But then, pretty soon after that, we have Christians being systematically hunted down and arrested by Saul. But then Saul becomes a Christian, Finally, now we must be doing okay. Well then, Paul is continually attacked, trying to be killed, and he's arrested a number of times. And then after that, we have the terror of Nero's uh, reign that comes along. And then Christians get thrown into arenas with lions for sport. And then Christians get blamed and persecuted for the fall of Rome. And just when they think the worst, every time, every time they think that the worst is probably behind them, things just seem to get worse. There's always the next thing. And we experience this to a degree, oh, thankfully for physical persecution's sake, to a lesser degree, but we experience this to a degree every Easter weekend. We have a somber Good Friday service and we remember the darkness of that day and the purpose for which Jesus died for our guilt and our sins. And then Easter, he is risen. We celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But then we attend a funeral four days later, or we find out that someone we know has tragically passed away far too early. We believe in Easter joy but the joy wears off quickly. We are constantly reminded of the already but not yet nature of Easter and the kingdom of God. It's already here. Jesus said the kingdom of God is among you. He rose from the dead. We are new creations in Christ. It's already here, but it's not here fully. It's not here yet in full. The kingdom of God is not here in full. Our final transformed bodily resurrection is not here yet. We are still waiting for the return of the king. And so it's no wonder that fatigue settles in. We hear a lot about COVID fatigue lately, but the church also experiences missional fatigue. You know, if we had read the whole book of Hebrews up to this point, we would have heard over and over again how Jesus is greater. He is greater than the prophets. He is greater than the angels and then Moses. He's greater than Joshua and the high priest. He's greater than Abraham and the tabernacle, the old covenant, the Old Testament sacrifices. And at the end of this chapter, chapter 12, we you hear that experiencing Jesus is greater than Moses' experience on Mount Sinai. It's all fantastic. 
It's all true. It's all life-changing and world-changing, and we are part of it. But in chapter 12, verse 3, we have this reality check that we also can grow weary and lose heart if we lose sight of the goal before us. If we take our eyes and our hearts and minds off of the one who has gone before us through death and into resurrection, we get fatigue, we grow weary and lose heart if we take our eyes off Christ. And the truth is, we do. And when we do, it's not just engagement in the mission of the church that begins to slide away. But it's the joy that goes. The joy of being on mission where Jesus is. It's that joy that begins to fade away. It's that joy that makes mission possible to endure for. It's the joy that makes, that is inviting for others to join in that begins to slide away. There's an Orthodox priest named Alexander Schmemann. He wrote back in the 80s that I think God will forgive everything except the lack of joy when we forget that God created the world and saved it. Joy is not one of the components of Christianity. It is the tonality of Christianity that penetrates everything. For all you who might feel like you are growing weary and losing heart. How is your joy these days? And if your joy has been growing dimmer, how do we get it back? Well, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews tells us, saying, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Consider him who endured. The way to get it back is by returning to the source of the joy itself. You see, right off the bat, we see that when we start to grow weary and lose heart, we're often thinking, oh, woe is me, or I have it so bad. Things are so hard for me. And sure, things might not be easy, but we lose sight of the biggest reality, that God came to earth because he loves you. He came as Jesus, who died for you and then rose from the dead again three days later. And he says that if you have faith in him, that he'll take you into resurrection life as well. (laughs) Woe is me? If you've lost the joy of being on mission with Jesus, it's because you've lost the vision, the vision of resurrection all things being made new in Christ. You've taken your eyes off the one who, in verse 2 of our text, who for the joy set before him, what? Just straight away ascended to heaven? Went on a long vacation? Retired early? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross? That's the counterintuitive source of our joy and path to joy, going through the cross. Because what is the joy that was set before Jesus that made the cross worth enduring? It wasn't a royal funeral like Prince Philip would have if there wasn't any COVID restrictions. It was only two people that were at Jesus' tomb. Uh, The joy set before Jesus wasn't seeing this huge revolt at his crucifixion, because at his crucifixion, all of his disciples were in in hiding afterwards. The joy set before Jesus that made the cross worth enduring was the joy of our redemption and his glorification to the Father's right hand. It was Jesus' joy to see your life purified and to see all creation redeemed, It doesn't mean there was no suffering involved. We know that there was. But Jesus' joy was ultimately to do the will of his Father. That's what he came for. That's what gives him joy. 
And that's what makes his ascension to the right hand of the Father such a joy, because he did accomplish the will of his Father. Imagine you are returning home to someone you love, um, your husband, your wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, or your parent, and they had asked you while you were out to do this and that, to run some errands and to do some things for them, and, and say you accomplished it all, and you didn't get distracted, and and you didn't say, well, I know you wanted me to get potatoes, but I thought instead of potatoes, why don't we just have potato chips? <laughs> and then you get home, and your spouse says, well, the potatoes were to go with the roast. Potato chips don't go in the slow cooker. Well, now all of a sudden, the joy of returning home isn't quite there. <laughs> if anything, you probably feel a little bit ashamed. But if you did everything you were asked to do, and everything you set out to do, and everything you wanted to do for that person that you love, then it's exciting to be able to walk back into the door and to be right before their presence. The know that the person you desired to please will be pleased because you did all of these things that you were committed to doing in a loving relationship. And that person there'll be so much joy returning to their presence, not because they're your boss or that you are paid to do these things, but because there's love that binds that relationship together because you share your whole life with that person. You see, if Christ came into this world and abandoned the Father's will in order to do his own thing, well, then he may have experienced worldly joy for a time, but then when he was going back to the Father's presence, well, there would have been a lot of shame. But what the author of the letter to the Hebrews tells us is quite the opposite, that Jesus scorned the shame of crucifixion for the joy set before him for your redemption and his glorification to the Father's right hand. And it's because of Jesus' path to his own joy that our text then tells us how we can claim the joy set before us as we carry on with Jesus' countercultural mission that he gave his church. And we can see this in at least three ways, three paths in these three verses for living an Easter joy in the tension of a world that's still marked by death. The first is to take the path of least resistance to heavenly joy. Note, this isn't about the path of least re resistance to worldly joy, but to heavenly joy, new creation joy. You see, the path of least resistance to worldly joy involves embracing sin, but the path of least resistance to heavenly joy remain, uh, requires dying to sin. Verse 1 of our text has this rallying cry to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles in order to run the race well. We need to throw off the things that create all that unnecessary resistance to pursuing the heart of God in this world and in our lives. When thinking about resistance and athletics, I'm reminded of the story of Graham Obrey. Uh, he was known as the Flying Scotsman in the cycling world. And in the early 90s, he, he was uh, infatuated with the one-hour record. He was an elite cyclist and time trialist. And so he set out to break the one-hour record. Now, the one-hour record is a track race where it's just you against the clock and trying to cover as much distance as possible as you can in the velodrome on, on that track in one hour. It's kind of like the equivalent of the four-minute mile for runners, except only one person can hold the record at a time. And pretty much every elite cyclist will try to break the one-hour record at some point in their career. And as Graham was training, he not only was training well you know, for his fitness, but he decided and realized that if he was going to break this record, he needed more aerodynamics and less resistance. And so he had to create, and he set about to create a whole other bike. He started from scratch, 
rather than just tuning things here and there. So he started with some old bike frames, welding things together. He used some dishwasher parts in his new bicycle. He totally changed the geometry of things, of how far apart the pedals were, and so his legs would be closer in. He totally redesigned the front end of the bicycle so that he would be leaning on his elbows, tucked like a downhill skier. He totally took out the top tube of the bike. His front fork for his front wheel actually only had one blade. This bike he created was aptly called Old Faithful. And with that bike, he actually set the one-hour record, both in 1993, and then after two people bested that record in the next 12 months, he broke it again. In 1994, he also went on to win uh, one of the track cycling titles in the World Championships in that time as well. In order to run the race and live as new creations in Christ, we must throw off the weights and sins that cling to us and slow us down in our living out the mission of Christ and seeking total transformation in the Spirit. And the good news is that we are given the very means needed to do that. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the Word to guide us. And we have the Holy Spirit to renew us and lead us and empower us. Grace, word, and spirit. These are the things that we can lean into more than the sins that defined our old life. Grace, word, and spirit are the path of least resistance to a life of Easter joy. Now, the second way this text invites us to embrace Easter joy is in perseverance. Embracing perseverance perseverance. Verse 1 continues to tell us that we should run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And then it continues to tell us where that perseverance comes from. It comes from fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ. And folks, in case you forgot, (laughs) Christ is risen. He ascended to heaven and he will return to make all things new. So keeping our eyes fixed on the end is what gives us the perseverance to be joyful and faithful in the middle, in this broken and confusing world as we wait for Christ's return. It's fixing our eyes on the end, the last things, allows us to have the perseverance of realistic hope in a world that tempts us to cave into fear. It's this vision of Christ's return that allows us to be able uh, to be in the world but not of the world. And what gives us the ability to love as we have been loved, even if that love is not returned back to us. Perseverance is a way that we can embrace Easter joy. And finally, the third way our text invites us to embrace Easter joy in a world that is still waiting for its full redemption is to scorn shame. Our text doesn't say that Jesus scorned the cross. To scorn something is to want to have nothing to do with it. Jesus did not scorn the cross, but he scorned the shame of the cross. Jesus didn't scorn the cross because he knew the joy that comes from going through the cross but he scorned the shame of the cross. He did not fear the mockery that comes and the stigma that comes with being crucified because of the greater joy that he would rise again from the dead and return to the Father's right hand and have the joy of doing his Father's will. And if you truly understand the hope and the joy and the assurance that Jesus' resurrection brings and gives to all people, then each one of us should be able to pick up our cross and pursue the good works that God has for us, that he's prepared in advance for us to do, and scorning any shame that might come with doing that work. Can we endure the cross 
of admitting our need for salvation and redemption, scorning the shame of having to be dependent on a transcendent God in an age of individualism, but to do it for the joy of being a child of God. Can you endure the cross of feeding the hungry, scorning the shame of giving out a freebie here and there to people who you'd rather see work for it, but to do it for the joy of serving the poor as if you are serving Christ himself? Can you endure the cross of asking for forgiveness from God, your sibling, your roommate, coworker, parent, or child, scorning the shame of admitting you were wrong and doing that for the joy of a reconciled relationship with a new future? Fix your eyes on the joy set before you. Look through the cross to resurrection and the joy of being in the Father's presence purified, transformed, and made new. People, are you ready? Can you see the joy? Are you set? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Now run. Amen. Let's pray. God, we praise you, for you are good. And you have gone before us into every trial because you came to this earth and you even went through the trial and judgment of death so that for us, death is not the end but the pathway to eternal life. You are the author and perfecter of our faith and so please perfect our faith. Make it new, transform it. Help us to cast off all of the stuff that brings resistance, unnecessary resistance in living in the power of resurrection, living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to fix our eyes only and always on you and restore to us the joy of our salvation. Amen.
as always, you are invited to join in in a Zoom call immediately after our worship service this morning. And there's a link in your Sunday morning email for that. And it'd be great to just share in the fellowship uh, of this church community for a little while after this church service. Uh, we hope that you are all doing well and uh, encourage you to perhaps just reach out to someone in the church that you haven't talked to in a little while today. Just call them up, send them a text saying the peace of Christ be with you. Uh, just try to do something intentional to reach out and, uh, and it's things like that that can also help restore the joy in people, the joy of being part of Christ's body here and being part of this church community. But as we go, may you go in joy knowing that our Lord and Savior is risen from the dead. We live in an Easter world and we will live forever with him. And in between now and the time when we will be united with Christ again, receive his blessing on the way. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>